everyone, and welcome to another exciting spoiler podcast. Today we're talking about Guardians of the Galaxy. I am Captain Logan, and right next to me is my partner, Mitch. That's me! We've also got Steve Baxby on the program. Hello! We've got Dan Torrey. Yo. And for the first time in a very long time for one of our panel discussions, we have the magnanimous Eric Holden. I think I, this is the first time I've ever been on a panel discussion that wasn't on my channel. Have you never done one of the spoiler podcasts with us? No, I was supposed to do Dark Knight Rises and I missed it. Oh yeah, that's right. Weren't you part of the Avengers podcast we did back in the day? No, nope. no he wasn't, because that was second season of Who Reviews the Reviewers, and he wasn't on the panel at that point. Oh, well, I'll pretend you were in my head. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Eric... I, I was you. hilarious. <laughs> Eric, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And right now, we're going to do what we always do. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go round robin and uh, let everybody give their initial thoughts on the movie. And then we'll just kind of open it up. And uh, this will be really kind of laid back and informal as always. And we'll just kind of chat about the movie for about an hour. Uh, let's begin with uh, Dan. Dan, tell us uh, uh, your kind of immediate thoughts leaving the film. And then give us uh, like a like a best thing, worst thing, if if you can. Uh sure. I had a good time at the movie. Uh, I wasn't as over the moon about it as I was for like Winter Soldier uh, previously in the summer. Uh, but I thought the movie was a lot of fun. It was unique in its uh, brand of humor. Uh, Marvel tries to put a, put humor in a lot of their movies, but I felt like uh, most of the jokes in this one uh, worked for me, and there were none that really like felt flat at all um which was a problem i had with some of the other stuff like thor 2 um but yeah i don't know like the the thing that really uh drove this movie for me was uh exploring that world and i don't know i i, I feel like i want to know more about it because i got we got like snippets of like all the characters backstories and stuff that seemed really interesting but we didn't really fully explore them so like i don't know it, it gave me I, I suppose enough that I'm like invested in the world and, and want to see more. But at the same time, I wish I could have gotten a little bit more in the movie. I don't know. Uh, Eric. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I feel like I'm seeing people uh, really loving it and think and saying it's the best, you know, Marvel movie yet. I don't have that. I, I, I really liked it. I thought it was good. Um, I, I was so happy with rocket cause that's a character I felt like they could really easily try too hard with. Um, I don't know what it is yet, but there's something structurally off, and it's bugging me, but I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I, last time I had was Man of Steel, where I was like, I don't know what's wrong with this movie, but there's something wrong. Um, and so I have that a little bit with this, but I really enjoyed it. Um, if, if I had like a really big complaint, it'd be that... Uh, I had a Gardens of the Galaxy comic book when I was when I was a kid, and there was a future Ghost Rider, and there was no future Ghost Rider in this. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why I have Eric on things because no one else in on cyberspace is going to make that complaint. Uh, is it that nobody has an eye patch. Somebody needs an eye patch in this movie. Steve. Um. Well, when I first walked out of this, I loved it. I don't know anything about Guardians of the Galaxy. When they announced this movie, I have I had no idea what the Guardians were, and I kept it that way on purpose just to see if I enjoyed the movie more that way. And I loved it. I thought it was a better team-building movie than The Avengers was. Um, the music is what got me, because the music is very important to the characters, and you kind of see Star-Lord flirting with certain ideas, and as the music changes um, themes, so does he. And it really gets you involved, and um, James Gunn does a great job of editing the music to make sure that you're completely immersed in it. If I had any complaints, it's that the plot and the villain are really cookie-cutter just to get these characters together. And that's a bit of an issue, because Ronan could very easily be more fascinating than he is, because he talks about how he's a zealot, and how he's a, like an offshoot or more extreme Kree soldier. And you could really easily do some more like commentary on that the same way Winter Soldier does. Um, but it didn't destroy the movie for me. Well, Vince, you and I already did a, a video on this, but uh, we'll, we'll each real quick briefly uh, give some foundational thoughts, too, just to get the ball rolling. But why don't you go ahead? All right. I, I think this movie has, uh, has some really strong character arcs for, for each of the, of the characters in the ensemble cast, but it does focus on one character, which is what uh, I tend to prefer, because you, you have a stronger through line when you have a central focus. But uh, nobody gets shortchanged in this. Everybody gets a, just a little bit of a nod, or at least all of the, the, uh, the heroes do. And 
the thing that uh, I liked the least about this movie was that uh, it was, and it was kind of just a quibble thing for me. It was Rocket had to interpret everything that Groot said, and I don't understand why. Like the only reason he would do it was so that uh, either the audience, obviously the audience, or the other people in the room. The, so that's the only reason within the movie that he would have to do that is he would have to explain what Groot said to the other people in the room. However, why would he care? And uh, a lot of the time, there's no reason for him to care. He just does it. Mm-hmm. And sure, you know, it's funny, and I, it didn't take me out of the movie too much. I, I just said, well, it was the easy way to do it, and then we moved on. The, uh, the things that I like the most about this movie is, uh, one, everybody has some kind of character arc. And uh, two, I think Groot's expressions are just so interesting. And uh, it's everybody has some kind of rapport with each other that uh that is merits just the way they interact and nobody's voice is exactly the same i think that's that's what i like so much uh my favorite thing about this going in was the punchiness of the script i uh, i think that this is a as I said when Vince and I reviewed it, I think this is a script that you can tell was really, really polished. Uh, there, there, a lot of work went into that. And every character has a distinct voice. Uh, everybody sounds really different. Uh, you, you get a good sense of who people are, even before you know a lot about them, just by the way they talk. Uh, and I'm such a big dialogue buff and a character guy that I really appreciated that, especially Rocket. Um, when he starts making up his own words and he's got like Rocketisms, I love stuff like that. It's, 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 it's really funny. Uh, and, and his were absolutely hilarious. Um, and then, you know, there'll be like a a lot of the comedy uh in the film isn't just there for a cheap laugh it it like reveals something about the characters and so like uh you know rocket is uh i guess i'm going to him a lot right now but like rocket is uh this this weirdly kind of damaged character because of the way he was like put together but then he has this like really weird kind of almost black sense of humor and so when they do the whole running gag of like him wanting the the uh, the cyborg guy's leg, and and then uh, and then later on he wants the eyeball, like it's hilarious. But also I, I felt like uh, it, it it informed that character a lot because uh, it, it, it like like it's almost I don't know it's almost perverse because like. Rocket is put together, you know. That's he, an interesting he, point. So, uh, so I, I thought that was really kind of interesting. Um, it, Steve, I had the same thing with you with the music, and uh, I'd like to very quickly, if I if I can, tell tell a quick story, uh, which is uh, which informs why I was uh, so. Um, Kind of, kind of immersed in Star Wars character. Uh, it, it, like, like, uh, like that really resonated with me because I had the precise same thing with my mom that he had with his. And uh, it, it's, and it's more relevant because of something that recently happened. Uh, when I was like six, I think, I think she dated it ninety one. Uh, when I was six, I had uh, a tape that my mother had made of some of my favorite songs at the time, including Bat Dance and the Ninja Turtles rap. And, uh, and, and, and some of her favorite stuff. And we listen to it in the car all the time. And for years, I've been looking for it. And I, could, and I could never find it. And I'm not kidding, about three weeks ago she found it. <laughs> and gave it back to me. And then I went and saw this movie, and Star-Lord has that, that connection with his mom. Uh, the one big thing that I do with my mom that that, uh, that 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 we that we enjoy together is we go to rock concerts and we go to we go to like arena rock shows, and uh, when when he got the second volume at the end that that really hit me in a place uh, really resonated with me really 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 cool stuff. Um, so as far as like uh, is is a negative uh, yes yeah, certainly not a perfect film. Um, I'm gonna agree with the complaints about the villain. Uh, certainly could have been more. I mean charismatic's not the right word. Because he's not that kind of a villain, right? Like you've got to be able to have your incredibly uh, like 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 dark and sinister and no nonsense kind of villains. You got to have those. But yes, we could have done more with that guy. Uh, in contrast to like Malekith and Thor: The Dark World, he got more screen time, so I kind of appreciate that. Uh, but the thing I had with 
I guess the reason I had less of a complaint with that than other people did is that uh, it's just simply an uh, informed thing. I didn't know anything about that character. And unfortunately, I knew Malekith before going into Thor The Dark World, and I don't think I would have cared about that as much if I didn't know that character. Um, so, like, I've been hearing complaints from people that know Guardians way, way, way better than me um, of certain characters, like like uh, like Yondu wasn't wasn't what he was in the comics. I don't know that character, so, uh, like, I thought the guy in the movie was fine. Um, so, like, I don't know. Some of that, I think, is less of an issue if you don't know the source material. But even still, uh, could have been a little bit more of an interesting villain. Having said, having said that, it's not a traditional superhero movie. It's not a movie that where where that the, the the villain thing is quite as important as it is when it's you know uh, just a guy who puts on tights and then goes out and fights the bad guy. Um, but we can talk about all of that and the artifact plot and if it was too cookie cutter um, and that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, who wants to jump on to something in there and just get rolling? Can I can I talk about Ronan? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Okay, uh, I, I actually thought that all of the uh, stuff with Ronan and the Nova Corps, I thought all of that was very Star Wars. Like, we ne when you watch Star Wars, outside of the Death Star, we never know why the Empire is evil. We don't particularly see anybody being treated poorly, except for people within the Empire. Um, you know, we there's a line in, like, the first Star Wars where it's just like, well, well, the, uh, the Council's been... You know, the Emperor's gotten rid of the Council. I thought it was very much like that, where it was, you don't really need to, need to know why he's a religious zealot. He's just, you. he's a fanatic, and that's, you know, there's nothing more important than that. You don't need to know what the peace treaty is. I thought it was really short-handy um, in the way that Star Wars does it. Um, or I, I thought they were looking to Star Wars on some level with that kind of thing. And they're clearly That's how I paralleling took it. a lot with like the Emperor and Thanos and um, Darth Vader and oh, Ronan gosh. because to an extent Darth Vader in the first film is a bit of a religious zealot with the Force. Yeah. Um, and then they have that big screen thing of a hologram of Thanos' face which is very similar to um, Empire Strikes Back when you see the Emperor for the first time. The only difference being of course that we actually get to see him in physical form before that happens. Yeah, but they're clearly homaging it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually kind of, now that you say that, I kind of wish they had introduced us to him that way, but it wouldn't have mattered because we already saw him in a, in a uh, after credit scene in Avengers. So. I feel like there, there, there is some homage stuff happening in this movie. When Cap and I were sitting there watching it, uh, Cap leaned over and he said, he's going back for that tape, that tape player, isn't he? And I said, it's his Indiana Jones hat. It's, I mean, of course... And then I was pissed for not thinking of that. It's, I mean, and I'm not saying that that's fans. an homage. I'm just saying that that's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that there there are some definite uh, tropes that are being used in this film that have been used in films of the past. And I guess, in this case, specifically, Lucas films. Well, and I think it's kind of interesting since those films themselves are homages to older things. You're right. We're in that tradition, aren't we? Like, you almost have to do that. Well, I think it's hard to do fun space adventure without looking at star wars or without star wars being compared to it even if that wasn't the intent yeah and i don't think it's just straight ripping off anything and and, and, it, and i think most importantly it's got a tone that's all its own i mean i feel like there's a mood yeah. with this movie that is very fresh oh yeah absolutely it's very much uh the director's vision i think right there eric I <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you and I uh, saw saw uh, a movie by this director called Slither last year. Yeah, and I and I have also seen his other film Super, and I didn't like either of them. Yeah, and we and we were <laughs> yeah, and, and, because, and that's why I brought this up. We 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 had Eric and I have not cared for this director, and we were a little bit nervous about that going in. Um, Eric, were you surprised? Uh yeah, I I, I really was, um, especially since uh, it doesn't feel like. I don't feel like Marvel Studios like tampered him down, which is kind of what I was I was thinking might happen. It feels like you know he's really got his voice in this movie, um, and it I, it helps that they don't that he doesn't have to deal with too much actual like adventure stuff. So he gets to kind of go off on his own and explore places that are not going to matter that much to the rest of what they're doing right now. Well, and my biggest problem with with both of his other films is they both feel like first drafts. So maybe it helps that somebody else wrote the script before he went through it. Um, so he had a better basis. Good point. I did feel like Super was uh, was all over the place, and the point was to be shocking. 
So, I mean, maybe... And I haven't seen Slither, but I got the impression that that's what it was, too. Slither is actually in this movie. What? Uh, In the collector's uh, chamber. There's uh, one of the Slither monsters is in one of the chambers. That's kind of awesome. That's hilarious. I didn't notice that. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for that tidbit. That was great. Hey, 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 Dan. Yeah. Uh, uh, Weigh in on something. Uh... I, I didn't want to interrupt all the good conversations. I'm sorry. Uh, what are you about a buck twenty? Weigh in on something? Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's not funny. In, in it's terms not funny. of like the Star Wars stuff, I agree with you guys. Like you kind of, you it's very hard to avoid that kind of thing. And this movie did make a lot of homages to it in like visual stuff and dialogue. Like, and but whenever they did it, it wasn't really like annoying to me. Like I would have expected, like they have Gamora be like, "Oh, your ship's dirty." Like you know, everyone reacts to the Millennium Falcon when they walk onto it, and the reason it didn't bother me was, it was because it fits Star Lord's character so well. Like he's such an unfocused buffoon that didn't grow up because he didn't have parents after he got abducted. That like you buy that his ship would be dirty in the first place. You wouldn't expect it to be clean. So like they did those sort of sort of homage things from a character place. Like I feel like. Everything in this movie was kind of done in in that vein. Like there was nothing that um, wasn't deliberately a part of who these people were. You know what I mean? And I think it also helps that nobody is like directly un like like not every character is directly analogous to another major Star Wars character. No, they're all Han Solo. I mean, what, what, <laughs> Groot would be chewy. I was getting to that, but yeah, yes, yes, Groot is kind of chewy. But Groot, in some places, almost even feels like an R two D two kind of role, uh, sort of. And then like Rocket Raccoon, of course, is Han Solo. But then Star Lord is like part Han Solo and part Luke Skywalker. Noodle that. Uh, and then Gamora is uh, like like Princess Leia if uh, she had been uh, you know brought to the dark side. Yeah, if she and... was actually uh, her father's daughter. Yeah, she's like Princess Leia and um, Lando. Huh. You're gonna have to explain that. Well, because because Lando's kind of kind of not on the on the on the the good side in in Empire, and then he kind of comes around, but he was never really on the bad side. It was just a matter of situation. Yeah, Lando yeah, only it's... does good things when it's advantageous to him. <laughs> but the difference with Gamora is that she's got this whole she's talking about this whole honor code, and I feel like that's not coming from no place. I feel like she's doing that because this is the way she wishes she could be, and now that she's finally getting out from underneath Thanos' thumb, she can develop that. I'm hoping um, Thanos learns to stop abducting children because apparently none of them are are on his side. Yeah, nobody's actually loyal to him, but that's that's comic book too. I mean, that's yeah. Um, I kind of like that they went there. I do have to say that. Um, that that Gamora. Let's talk about her for a minute. Gamora uh, strikes me as not having really enough of a reason to go rogue right when she does. It's, yeah. yeah, that does feel a little bit too convenient to me. Where it's like she's been having to, to work with Nebula and Thanos for all this time, and then it's just kind of oh go d- go do this errand for me. Oh, I- I'll do it. Because I've read the script and I know I'm gonna meet up with Star Lord and Groot and, and Rocket, and, you, know, you know what I mean? Like I don't know. I feel like that that was the the, the one really weak kind of kind of story thing in the setup. I feel and like there was just like a scene missing or like a prelude comic or something that just set up. Because it's when we there was that there actually was a prelude comic that set that up. Oh okay. <laughs> well, when we meet her, she's already made that decision. Um. Oh oh, that's a good point. I, no wait. You, do you think so? Yeah, I don't feel like it's something she arrived at. I feel like that happened before we see her. Like it was kind of calculated? Because the thing is, she goes and takes a job that was supposed to be Nebula's. Yeah, but then she immediately... It's not like she uh, went after Star-Lord and then had like some kind of change of heart. She's already uh, in in contact with the, with the Collector. Oh, that's a really good point. Okay. So she just had some stuff wor- working on. So the catalyst for all of that is the Infinity Gem, is what you're saying. Is that she knows about that already, so the ball's gotten rolling. The, b- <laughs> the ball's rolling, Vince. The, the, the thingy the, that holds the orb. The, the orb is rolling now before, before we even get to the theater. Yeah, okay. What I don't quite understand is what she thinks she's going to do to escape Thanos. Like, uh... I kind of understand Nebula's Nebula's idea. She's going to hook up with Ronan, and Ronan now has the ability, or at least potentially the ability, to destroy Thanos. But uh, I guess Gamora is just going to get four billion units and run. Is maybe the idea the Collector is going to protect her? 
uh, or something like that. Sense. I got. I, I feel like she was more about the money. Says she's like, how much are they going to pay? Well, four billion units. So what is what he's going to pay her four billion units, and then he's, she's just going to hang around. And that is part of a motivation thing. I mean, keep in mind that everybody is after money except for. Drax. So what and, you're saying is kind of baseball too. The soy No, no, money. there's there's a there's a whole there's a whole thing about that, Eric. Where like where like uh, uh, she, uh, Drax says, I don't care about money, and then uh, and then Star Lord says, Well, we can split it three ways, and then Groot's all angry, and he's like, Oh, okay. Oh, well, you're right. So no, Groot, wants, Groot, Groot wants money too. Yeah. <laughs> Groot wants money too. <laughs> <laughs> that and fountain water. And fountain water. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so. So, um, I want people's opinions on Gamora. Uh, do, do do you guys, uh, on the whole, agree with me that she's kind of the weak link, but still o- okay, or do you think that Zoe Saldana was just fine? I thought she was fine. I mean, I thought the the romance and the flirty thing that they had going on was really typical, and I wasn't really like into it when those scenes were going on. And uh, I was hoping that they wouldn't have them like be, you know, in a some sort of relationship by the end which like they kind of hinted at it when like everyone planeteers up to save the day at the end uh don't not planeteer man that's <laughs> awesome. that's great we had earth wind water fire and heart okay because yeah. it was still a stick that, that was another small issue i had i thought the ending was kind of corny but um i don't know what... it's kind of that sort of movie isn't it like it's it, like i mean i don't know i I kind of was like, yeah, come on, guys. <laughs> this is a little corny for me. But uh, you didn't like a Marvel movie ending with a dance-off? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought Ronan might have been a little smarter than that. But uh, I, yeah, I questioned that myself. I don't know why he wouldn't just shoot him in the face. I, yeah. love, that, I love that we got the big bad villains just, be, just having a really human reaction of what? What well, are you was doing? Funny, but- seems unlikely that he wouldn't immediately be like right after that like oh wait it's a distraction yeah, why you would know? he why would he care what he's doing there's no reason for him to care what he's doing he's like has him about to shoot him in the face and obliterate him completely you're right there's a little bit of lazy there i mean or at least sloppy because because before that i i also quite i saw it again today and i didn't question this the first time but the second time i was like i was like so so really like uh uh yondu pulls out his like whistly floaty stick and he starts whistling, and then the floaty stick flies around and stabs all those guys. And yeah, it goes pretty fast, but we see it in real time. It's not like it's sped up or slowed down. And all those guys are carrying really big guns, and none of them is like, holy crap, it's coming, I better shoot this guy. I think you have to chalk that kind of thing up to Stormtrooper Syndrome, you know? I don't know. All of the well, minions are just dumb. Well, all their, all their guns are like... It was hilarious. All, all, all their guns are like BPRD guns. They they take like a minute to warm up, and they've got to flip some switches. And... <laughs> <laughs> I Go kind ahead. of wondered if they uh, if they were just more concerned about trying to get out of the way of this thing, but again, that would still be stormtrooper syndrome. No, they were just standing there. Well, it was moving so fast that it everybody wasn't moving else that was like fast. In slow motion, right? No, it wasn't. That's the thing. Is it the way they played it? It wasn't moving all that fast. And it literally, like, some of the guys are just staring off into space and not even noticing that everyone else is falling down around them. They're all like, well, there's no way it could, it could reach me. It's just an arrow. <laughs> I'm only bringing this up to support that there are a couple of kind of sloppy things in that third act. I, I, I think there's a lot of just, like, isn't this cool or isn't this funny? Um, oh, yeah. And, like, it almost, like, like Amazing Spider-Man has that, where, like, you have comedy scenes where we remove logic, um, and we're never going to bring up again the fact that he destroyed the the bathroom and i think that there's stuff like that in this movie where it's like well for for this moment this movie's a comedy and i think it sometimes works because the movie is kind of a comedy um and and then other times it, it doesn't work as well but well, i think the Why whole through going... line with it is that it wants to be a comedy and it does it really well but when you get to that ending the comedy becomes the plot device to just kind of finish off situations because it's really cool that he has an arrow that he whistles and, it's, and he can kill a whole bunch of people, we use that joke as the conclusion to that weird plot thread of um, them wanting to force the Ravagers to turn on the Nova Corps. And then the dance-off thing, uh, it's a funny joke, but the joke is the plot device to distract Ronan long enough so they can stop him. And they kind of stop trying to be a drama and comedy at the end, and they just go full-on comedy. I, I don't know if I'd go that far. Yeah, I wouldn't go that I, far. I, 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 I think the Care Bear stare ending is not comedy. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is either. And, and also, like, people are... And, and, and Dan, I, I, I respect your opinion, but I don't completely agree with it. I like, like I think they did a pretty good job of setting up that ending yeah. when they showed us the hologram earlier of the of the few people in the past that have managed to 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 get together and hold on to the infinity gym for for a little while and they did it exactly the same way and so when we see it in the end yeah it's played up as like a really heartfelt kind of touching thing and symbolic of the like friendship that they've attained and stuff and they they got the billing the billing music and all of that but i didn't feel like it came out of nowhere i felt like they did a really good job of setting that up which i think made it less sappy well Well, i mean i I I don't know i i've seen people planeteer up before in things and it's always corny to me even if they set it up in the movie before you know what i mean i don't know that's maybe that's just personal preference but like i have i have i have have two things about it uh the first one is i i like it just because i thought this whole movie did a great job of making uh the infinity gems far more dangerous than they are even in the comics that just holding one can kill you if you're not strong enough yeah um and so the fact that it needed all of them to hold it i thought was was really good but there's also a it, – it, it actually is, I think, a thematic thing that goes back to the opening scene where his mom is dying and he he can't accept death and doesn't take her hand. And here right. he takes everybody's hand in the face of death and they might not make it. I think that's the conclusion of his arc. Yeah, that's what I thought too. I mean, they, he's he's found this courage that goes beyond just – just you know self-preservation or whatever it is that he wants and i think that he's already kind of concluded that arc when he chooses to go save the day just to save the day in the first place and then that's like the symbolic end of it where we get to we get to really see it play out like like in a scene where everything comes full circle yeah precisely I mean, if it had been me, I wouldn't have edited in the flashback of the hold my hand. That was a little on the nose. Thing. Because, yeah. Yeah. because if I, especially after I've seen it a second time, yes, I'm remembering that. I remembered it the first time. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm paying attention. You did a good enough job of, of making that scene memorable enough that don't, ca- don't cut yourself short by thinking yeah. that I'm dumb enough I need a flashback. I kind of love the fact that, uh, like, I wouldn't call that part comedy. Well, obviously not the flashback part, but I wouldn't call the Care Bear stare as you call it comedy. Uh, I do like the fact what that... What other 80s cartoon can we go to? <laughs> I, I, uh, Rainbow Bright? <laughs> well, they're like, they're like combiners, right? Like Transformers. <laughs> I do like the fact that you have uh, these three, as, as we find out, very powerful people... Uh, one through genetics, one through being a particular race, one through be- being genetically altered, and then Rocket, this like raccoon creature, reaches up <laughs> this little itty bitty thing, and that's the one that just helps cap it off. That was just funny to me. So I would call that part comedy. So it's not like they forget it within that moment. Well, I'm assuming he's pretty durable too. Well, like I, he was yeah, killed. like he's a genetically engineered like super rodent. He's a <laughs> super rodent. He has so much what's a, what's surface a, area. What's a raccoon? It's what you are, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, wanna... well, well, talking about Gamora, I was surprised getting back to that. Um, Thanks. I, That's actually basically where I was about to take it. Thanks. I, I, uh, I'm not a Zoe Sandala fan. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I ever think she's really bad, but she had that. She had that thing where, like, she had a year where she was in like every movie. Um, and I just got burned out, and I'm like, I don't want to see her anymore. I thought she was all right in this. I thought she was the weak lead. Uh, I think, well, there's some scenes where, where, where Drax is clearly a wrestler and not an actor. Um, but Oh, I'm going to agree with that. I thought he was fine. I, yeah, I thought he was fine, too. I liked him for the most part, but there's a couple of deliveries where I was like, oh, yeah, you're not you're an actor. But um, I, I thought she was kind of the weak link team, but not a drastic uh, weak link. I thought she was. I was surprised that I liked her as much as I did. I think Saldana did well. I just think that uh, the the problems with her character might have been problems with uh, uh, like a momentary lapse in directing. He just said, "Yeah, that's fine. We'll use that." And uh, I feel like she could have. Uh, they could have gotten a better performance out of her if they pushed her a little bit more. There were a lot of places where she was just too soft for a living weapon. Well, yeah, and, and that's, oh, sorry. That's the only. That's all right, Eric. I mean, uh, that's the only thing that I thought was strange about her was that uh, there were some scenes where she was very much so a warrior woman, and then there are other scenes where uh, she would have these like strange guttural noises that just sounded too whimpery for a 
for, I mean, and her dialogue delivery was largely fine, but... I mean, I think Gamora can be effeminate, but she's got to be kind of tough effeminate. I'm not really buying yeah. the, like, the softy thing. And it's... That's that's essentially where I'm coming from. Go ahead, Eric. Well, and and I think maybe it's not her fault at all, but she is essentially the straight man to a group of comedians, because yeah, a, because you have Rocket and and Star Lord, they're both really charismatic and funny. You know, Groot's Groot, and while Drax is a straight man, he's a very he's still even though he doesn't know it, he's kind of a joke in taking everything literally everything. So she. Like, she doesn't have any of that. She doesn't have a quirk that makes her funny, and so I think it's harder for her than any of the other characters. And as for Gamora herself, I do feel like uh, uh, she's the... I think that the problem in this movie is not necessarily Sadana. I think that the problem in this movie is that uh, Gamora is kind of the weak link where we don't know a heck of a lot about her. We don't know what her end game is. We just know that she's going to sell this thing, and she thinks that's going to get her away from... Uh, from Thanos, and uh, you don't need money to run; you can just get the hell away. It it's pretty easy to get in the headspace when we see adaptation sometimes, and I mean this is a thing where you know most people don't know what Guardians is, so it can get get away with a lot. And uh, I, I, but I think I think even still, uh, those of us that have read anything from from this, I, I think it's easy to get in the headspace of um, oh, you know, if it's comic, it's gold, and we want it to be you know just like it was in the comics. The thing is, Gamora. I mean, just looking at, at the Guardians that I've read, she's always the weak link in the comics for me too. Like I've never I, I, like like I can't, I can't I can't really get into her in the comics either. Um, I mean, like, the fact that it, it seems like usually, at least with Mendes' stuff, we're just relying a lot on she's Thanos' daughter, she's Thanos' daughter, and she's really tough and, you know, she's a tough chick and uh, you know, we want strong women now so Gamora's great, but, like, I don't know, I, I just like, I've never gotten really into her anyway. So, um, so that's a thing. So you're right, I mean, some of it could just be kind of in the character. Um, let's hear from uh, Steve or Dan. I think one of the most interesting things about the team dynamic in this movie that I really kind of latched onto is how vastly out of touch all, all these people are with like regular, like human beings or like what like you know a sentient being would be I suppose since we're out in space with aliens and stuff. Like I don't know, none of them really like understand how to interact with other people um, in like meaningful like intimate ways until they all come together as a team except for Groot. And I think that's why he stands out as like the heart of the movie because like you see him like give a flower to a little girl, he knows how to make people happy, um, so things like that. Like Star Lord, he uh, he never really grew up after his parents um, kind of like his mom died and he got abducted. He's like still listening to the same music and like you know doesn't really want to settle down in a in a relationship with any woman he kind of like you know is a womanizer and steals things and does whatever he wants and he's kind of unruly and Gamora has the same kind of thing going on but it's like the rebellious you know father that wasn't good to her kind of thing like in Rocket obviously has uh, his uh, thing how he was made and Drax doesn't have a family anymore and he's really literal and you know he thinks he can just call up an enemy with an army and he'll come face him one-on-one -on -one. like they don't really realize how like interpersonal relationships work until they, well, they all have major anti-social tendencies certainly. yeah exactly they're they're really out of touch people and i think that's where a lot of the comedy like worked for me when they were dealing with how out of touch those people were and it's believable and understandable because not a single one of those people should really be very good at socialization yeah, exactly. right like fuck it what do you what do you have you yeah, know, like, like Star-Lord isn't in touch with either of the cultures he wants to be a part of, which is interesting. Like, he's like a product of 1988 in the past on Earth, and, you know, what little he understands about the galaxy he was plopped into, you know? It's it's funny and interesting. Dan, did you wonder, because you and I, uh, reviewing stuff, we were always talking about family dynamics and father-son relationships especially. Uh, did you find yourself... Uh, wanting a, a bit more about Yondu and Star Lord's relationship because he's the closest thing to a father figure that kid would have had, and I didn't feel like they really brought that that to the forefront at all. I feel like the family dynamics with like all the characters were kind of left in the background, really. Like that that relationship, and then Thanos and Gamora's relationship was kind of mentioned, uh, you know, as being vaguely bad, but we don't really know all that much about it. Like I feel like if you fleshed out those two things a little bit more, the relationship between Star Lord and her would have been a little bit more. Uh, interesting and compatible, right? Because you have two characters that have these like backgrounds with fathers that weren't very good people and didn't have mothers in their lives for most of the time. 
Yeah, and I wonder if part of the problem is making movies that aren't singular movies where we know we have more room to do that kind of stuff later. Yeah, where, exactly. where You have to look at this more like a pilot of a TV show. If this was the pilot of a TV show, you wouldn't be complaining so much about that stuff because they might cover it in the second episode or they might cover it in the second season. Um, if we had eliminated the middleman, Dan, and had, Th- and had Thanos and not... Uh, Ronan, then we would have probably instantly had some of that, some of that father-daughter stuff with with Thanos. But because we have to leave him kind of in the background, um, we we get like a scene or two of him, so that we get like like two little scenes of him, so that you know us fanboys aren't or us fans watching the film aren't going, oh man, you got a movie where there's all this Thanos talk, but I didn't get to see Thanos. Like yeah, I finally got to, I got I got to see Thanos in a scene for a little while. Um, like like they they uh, they're not allowed to do very much with him. So I think some of of that unless you just resort to a bunch of flashbacks i think is almost inherent in the material yeah and i mean like it wasn't a detriment to the film not having it there it's just that's something i was thinking about like maybe i would like these character uh, and not that i didn't like them it's like maybe i would be a whole lot more invested in uh, especially that love relationship because that was like the one interpersonal relationship of the team that i didn't really get like all of the other characters coming together, like, I understand the reasons why they come together and, like, become friends by the end as a whole group. But those two specifically, I, I wondered about a little bit. I thought it was a little weak for me. I feel like this movie, like, the point of this movie is that everybody's uh, some kind of an orphan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I feel like any chance, like, if you were to find a father figure in this, uh, it would all be kind of fabricated because uh, I almost feel like we need to know less about... Yondu, and we need to know more about uh, the Ravagers, and uh, and I'm not saying that we can't know more about Yondu because he's, well, the, he's leader the leader of, of them. So I understand why he is a father figure, but I almost feel like shining a light on that would uh, would kind of distract you from the point that they're trying to say everybody is a loner, and well, not not even that they're they're a loner, but they are on their own. Well, I disagree, Vince. I think it's I, I think when I say father figure, I, I more mean like. Like uh, here's here's why it's a damage really. I mean, not damage, but like like here's why he's not a good father figure. You know what I mean? Like it's almost like they sweep it under the rug a little bit so that they don't have to deal with it. Because like I had to keep reminding myself that that was the guy that that uh, that abducted him and that that was the guy that kind of raised him. Like it wasn't a good relationship. I don't think he's a. I don't think he's a solid father figure even a little bit. I don't think he sees himself that way. And certainly, obviously, he just sees Star Lord as somebody that he can manipulate. But and just use for however he he needs to use him. I don't get the sense that he even really has any familiar familial ties to him at all. But I don't feel like it's really discussed enough. So like I, I guess I guess I'm agreeing with you about about that it's about orphans, and I think that they needed to make more of a big deal out of these were terrible father figures. They did they didn't work in that in that way, and I feel like it's just not really talked about much. Yeah, well, and I mean, and you want them to kind of examine like what about the people that raise them makes them feel like orphans exactly well and 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 i was i'm curious how long star lord was with yondu because it doesn't look like that lifestyle at all uh influenced him like it the way he acts it feels like he's just been alone his whole life since he was abducted i don't feel like I agree with that. the the ravager thing influences his lifestyle at all why do you say that, then? Well, because he see, it seems to be, and they even said in the movie that uh, Yondu goes too easy on him. So, in some ways, I feel like uh, Yondu has some connection to the father that we're unaware of, and uh, he doesn't want to kill this boy, and he wants, and he has some kind of soft spot for him because, of course, they kept him for twenty six years as opposed to delivering him to the person they were supposed to deliver or him eating to. him or eating him, as we're told multiple times. Yeah, which I think is also. Uh, I think that's supposed to be, like, they inferred that this is Bull, that he's not actually somebody that they were ever going to eat. Uh, everybody on that ship, or most everybody on that ship, is mostly human. So, Well, I mean, uh, in terms of how long he was with the Ravagers, I was under the impression that the people that abducted him were those people, and they were supposed to take him to his father, and that yeah. never happened, and, like, the reason why he's a pirate and a thief is because he was raised by them. Yeah, I thought, yeah. He, I thought he was a pirate and a thief because he thought it was cool. Well, well, par- partially, but it's also because that's all he knows. I-, I think the deal is he is. I think he is a pirate who vividly remembers being an '80s kid. Yeah, yeah. 
I think he was just allowed to uh, keep his own culture, and that uh, I feel like a, a lot of these guys chose to be a part of this ship, and uh, they chose to be underneath the command of Yondu, and he grew up that way, so he has a little bit of a rebellious spirit, so he has that uh, that own he has his own identity outside of this, and uh, Yondu allowed that to flourish and allowed that to exist, as opposed to trying to force him to be a pirate, which, that's how he was soft on the boy. And also, all of these people with the Ravagers have their own wants and interests and would, would you know, cut the throat of, of the guy right next to him as soon as it, it is, is, you know, it it, uh, it pleased them, right? Like, as soon as it, as it helped them. So, he's he's got that a little bit, so that makes him, I mean, he's not ruthless like that, but it makes him a loner. Well, I agree with you, Vince, and I see what you're saying there about, like, family dynamics kind of needing to be there a bit more. But at the same time, all of these characters are people with identities that are forced on them um, because of just extenuating circumstances. And because of Peter Quill, um, even though he has a little bit of Yandu's influence on him, he's still a rebellious kid. And the reason they all kind of hovel around him is because he's able to guide them out of the identi- out of the self-imposed identities and able to give them a different mission. Peter Cole may like being a bit of an outlaw, and he flirts with that idea quite a bit, but he also wants to be a bit more than that, which is why they kind of embrace being Guardians of the Galaxy. And all the other characters just don't know how to circle around that. So the family relations, like especially with Yondu, could have helped that theme a little bit. But I think at the end of the day, it really is just about why are these characters doing what they're doing, and why can they form the Guardians? And the whole Than being the daughter of Thanos, or Drax's family being killed, or Rocket's history, or um, his relationship with Yondu, all that stuff's sequel territory, because we need to know why these five people work together first. Yeah, I agree with you. And and as Vince said early, a lot earlier, it is about Star-Lord first. Yeah. And I think that it would have really bogged the movie down and messed with pacing a lot if, uh, as I've heard some people suggest, um, that didn't care for the film as much, we'd had a whole bunch of flashbacks about all of these characters. I mean, some people yeah. wanted, like, like flashbacks with... Um, Drax's family and see what Drax was like before he got, you know, as, as, as like, you know, hard-hearted as he was and that kind of thing. And uh, I just think that that would have really bogged the movie down. And also, these are not the, I mean, I don't mean to belittle it, they're, I like them, they're interesting, they're fun, but this movie is more about, I mean, it, it's about a lot of stuff, but it's more about being fun than it is anything else, and you don't want to bog it down too much with that stuff, so I just feel like if um, I, I just feel like these are not the most like serious characters in the world. Well, it yeah, kind of all comes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, How dare you? I, I was just gonna say that um, I think the, the the fact that we're able to talk about these characters and want more from them a little bit, and other people have felt the same way, is not like a detriment to the movie. Almost, I think it's almost a credit to it because they give us enough where like it's kind of the Star Warsy thing where like you you get just enough to know about you know, who Han Solo is in the, in the current moment. And you have like the things that are told about his past and stuff, but you don't necessarily need to know them to like roll with how fun and interesting his character is in that moment. Um, so like, I don't know, like, I feel like these characters potentially have backstories interesting enough. We could give them their own solo movie. Not that you like, I'd necessarily need to see that or that that would ever happen. But like, I don't know. I think the characters are fully realized enough within the context of the story they're trying to tell here that um you know uh, i think it's a it's a positive thing to say we wanted more out of them i guess i don't know some some of these characters are a little bit mysterious here and there and so you don't want to know too much about them but also importantly to what you just said dan uh star wars is a huge classic and had no flashbacks yeah exactly well and uh, saying I, I, enough about certain things like drax is really punisher in some ways where his family's killed he's out for revenge, but like some Punisher versions would say that maybe that was just an excuse for him to like psychologically have fun with killing people, and Drax is definitely a bit of that. Um, I, 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 I think it kind of all comes down to, uh, it's kind of a black humor joke that, that Rocket makes, but when he's, when he's like, we all have dead people, it's, 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 it's moving forward. Um, and I think that's kind of how the movie is, like, these, these are all people that have tragic pasts, we don't need to, we don't to you know drench them up and really you know uh go into it you you get it. this movie is really economically written i think is uh the word that just keeps coming back to my mind is that everything has uh, some kind of uh, everybody gets a little bit of their past revealed it's uh, satisfying enough to, at least up to a point to where uh 
things can develop within the plot, and it can be uh, not just a plot-driven movie, but these people make choices based on their, their past experiences. And uh, so if I say a movie's economical, in my mind, that's really high praise, because uh, a lot of the time it'll end up meandering all over the place. And uh, this, this is streamlined, and we get enough. And enough is all we need because, I mean, especially even at the end of the movie, they say there's going to be a second one. If there's anything you didn't get, it's going to be there. No, not necessarily. But uh, yeah, there's but, potential for it to. Yeah, yeah. but but at, the, but at the same time, as you might you might want more things about the. I don't feel like anybody is like two dimensional or too stereotypical or, yeah. or just, you know, because we didn't learn every single thing there was to know about them. Well, and like, I, I don't know what more there is to learn about Drax. Like, he lost his family outside of seeing him as a happy family man. Like, what more is there to do with that character? Um, uh, you know, I, I think Rocket's kind of that way, too. Like, we get it. He's made. He's, he's, kind of, he's kind of sad about that. And he's a space pirate. Like, what more is there to... I don't feel like we need to go back and... The only one I think, really, is Star-Lord and Gamora. And we know that they're going to do that. I mean, they set up plenty of that to happen. Maybe, maybe a whole movie about Groot, Groot's backstory could be interesting, but... See, I, I want to see Weapon Raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> the I was totally thinking of that, bud. <laughs> That's 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 hilarious. Yeah, well, in, in, X-Men in, Origins, in, Rocket Raccoon, <laughs> <laughs> Guardians Origins. It's in Vietnam, well, too. It'll be great. Thing, wouldn't you much rather learn some of those things through like a past coming back to haunt you story than through generic flashbacks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, and I think that's kind of set up with Rocket specifically. Um, yeah, and, and with Star Lord. If, I gotta tell, one of the things I was most surprised by was not getting anything about uh, uh, Jason and Spartax, and that that like it's hinted at. And I really expected to go into a movie where it was going to be about Star Lord meeting his dad, and it's it's crazy to not have that right away. Well, you, you know, um, it's funny because I've read some of the end of stuff and it actually made this movie kind of trick me because the entire movie i assumed what was in the the present box was the space gun i didn't even think of another cassette tape i'm like oh well that's his dad's space gun that's what i thought that's because i 100 percent thought it was going to be another tape but of course i didn't read any of the guardian stuff well, and it should have been a tape. And the thing is, I, watching it a second time, I felt like an idiot that I didn't call the tape because the first one's called Volume 1, so there's got to be another yeah. one somewhere. See, and I think the interesting thing about his father, too, and, th and this is kind of like criticism aside, maybe it's just fanboy speculation, but, like, I'm not what? I'm not so sure that it is, like, maybe they're changing who his father is from the comic books because, like, they say he's, like, part ancient power that something they've never seen before. Yeah. Or they, they they just like Adam what Warlock, the Spartax is. Or something. I mean, that would be cool. If Yondu can be different, then uh, not? Yondu's different, Yorona's different. So, I mean, obviously they're going different directions with some things. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and that could be really incredibly interesting uh, to not have him be... But, but obviously, I mean, he still could be both. He still could be like the king of an empire um, or the rule of an, uh, of an empire because obviously he's got enough clout that he can hire people to go kidnap his son. So or going with what everyone's been speculating is going to show up in the Marvel movies. Uh, his dad could be an inhuman. Oh, because oh, be that's what ball. everyone's decided uh, Marvel's doing for mutants. So you could do that. That would that would make him also a prince too, because he could be like you know Black Bolt's son or something. That'd be cool. But I assume they'll just change what the Spardex is and make it, you know, merge it with something else or like their descendants of the Celestials or their Eternals or something like that. Right. Which, by the way, I almost jumped out of my seat when I saw a Celestial. Yeah, it was cool. Didn't didn't see it. This I, I we haven't really mentioned this. I think more than any other Marvel movie, this is kind of Marvel porn. And I know there's stuff that I didn't get. I didn't know Yondu was a person. Um, I didn't either. There was so much stuff where I was like, that's that's this really cool little Marvel thing, and that's a really cool Marvel thing. Are you surprised we didn't see Richard Ryder or any of the other like main character and Nova characters? I was kind of surprised. No, because I, I assume if we were going to do Richard Ryder, we'd cast like a real person. It wouldn't just be... A throwaway. The only thing I was really surprised we didn't get was the the Kree Supreme Intelligence, the big like, jelly brain guy. Yeah, the thing that uh, Ronin usually talks to. Yeah, yeah. I I was surprised we didn't get that, but other than that, uh, I, I I thought this movie was just 
bursting with, like little Marvel stuff. I'm sure fans of cosmic Marvel picked up way more than I did. I agree. Like there is um, that that Soviet dog that you see, that's like apparently Rocket's rival in the comics. And when they like sneer at each other and growl, that's like a reference to the fact that like they have this huge like rivalry in the comic books. That dog is actually a character. So who I knows just know, gonna, just like, know he's his name is Cosmo. Yeah, or Cosmos. Yeah, exactly. Well, what's funny is this week of or, or last week rather, uh, there's been all this uh, stuff popping up that's in this movie that's like me that's like regular Marvel canon stuff that I've never seen before so suddenly we can't do a Guardians book that doesn't have nowhere in it and I've never heard of that before is that a real then, Marvel place I guess yes, unless they just made up a new one because it was in the last Guardians issue or some Guardian in fact I think it was there were two Guardians things last week there was like the Marvel 100th anniversary thing and then there was a regular Guardians book I think it showed up or was mentioned in both of them and then and then the dog was in one of them. Uh, okay, so since we're talking about like fan stuff, because I've, I've been wanting to bring this up, uh, does anybody else, or am I just jumping the gun too quick with this, feel like they've made the uh, the Infinity Gems really generic? Like, I like that they're super powerful, but why doesn't it have d- uh, different properties than just blows up things? Uh, apparently <laughs> they do. I looked on the wiki. They're different than what the, like, the color's... Uh, coordinate to different things, but according to the wiki, I don't know where the source is. They do each have a um thing, different properties. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. when, because I would have figured that as soon as he put it, and I don't remember what the colors do, but I mean, but I mean, you know, I, like, there's like a time gem and an earth gem, but like, like, uh, like once, once uh, Ronan puts it in his staff, I really kind of expected that he would have specific powers, and it seemed like just uh, I can blow stuff up now. So I so then I thought well maybe it's the Earth gem because you can blow stuff up but I don't know. Well, one um, would assume that the okay. Tesseract is the Mind gem because it can control people, right? That's what I that's what I assumed, but Wikipedia says it's something different. Oh, okay. It's weird because the, the Tesseract's got to be one of them. It is because we saw a picture. I mean, because we saw <laughs> we saw a video of it, and I was like, well, that's weird. Why is it shaped different? Oh nope that that thing has been removed from wiki so maybe that's not a thing uh red is power which is what um the ether was the ether yeah yeah uh oh. blue is mine so that makes sense purple is space a little bit oh. less so i don't know if that correlates as well well when they planet here space forms around them so i guess that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well, apparently, like, Kevin Feige and a bunch of Marvel people already, like, hashed out what the Infinity Gems are going to be, and we just haven't seen it on film yet. So, like, Avengers 2 or Avengers 3 or Guardians 2 is going to handle all of that? Yeah, I'm kind cool. of assuming that that they now have their MacGuffins for the rest of their films until Avengers 3, right? Like, we now have had two films where Infinity Gems have been MacGuffins. Like, if they need a MacGuffin for a movie, it's going to be it, the Infinity Gems, whether we know it or not. And we even well, saw, like, the Infinity Gauntlet in the first Thor movie. Like, they have a plan for what these are. It's, just it's actually it's not dead. there. It, it got cut out. It's not oh, actually it? in the movie, yeah. Yeah, I, never, I didn't see I, I've looked for it. It's not in there. That's weird, because when that movie was coming out, like, it was at Comic-Con. Yeah, and, and we know that it was there, and they shot it, but it's not actually in the final film. Oh, okay. So uh, a lot of people, I'm glad you used the word MacGuffin, Eric, because I am hearing some people uh, complaining that, oh man, it's another artifact plot. Everybody's after an object again. Why do we always have to do it like that? Uh, just as an excuse to get these characters together. And it bothered me less here than it does in other things. I guess part of it just is uh, I'm, I'm an Infinity Gauntlet fan. Well, and, it bothered you know, me less here than it did in Thor because I felt like here an, uh, a MacGuffin is a good way to get people together whereas with thor it didn't need to be the plot it could have it's not like it's not like it's the excuse to not have any character progression right like like everybody in a especially when you have an ensemble cast everybody in a movie needs to want something and that's the thing they all want so so like like it's not like we're skimping out on learning anything about these people or doing anything interesting with them so i didn't have a problem with it when they even Um, address it he says it's like the maltese falcon yeah, I like that he said that. Well, and the other thing, too, was um, I've heard people complain about that, but I don't know that I've read very many Guardians things at all that weren't Star-Lord trying to go after a thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're kind of space pirates. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you've got these people, their professions are like, you know, a pirate, a warrior, a bounty hunter, well, two bounty hunters, and I don't know what Drax did before. He was just kind of crazy before that, I guess, and in prison. 
So, like, I don't know, these are people that would, like, be chasing after objects anyway, right? Like, even if it wasn't something ultra-powerful. Um, yeah, so it's going to be uh, it's gonna be an object of some kind, or it's going to be money, and that's generic, or it's going to be a person. Like, what else could it possibly be? Right, yeah, it exactly. just, it, it works really well as a, I, I, I'd be a little disappointed if that's what the next film is also about, but it yeah. works good as a, as a bringing the team together plot. And it felt like such a Lucas, uh, you know, like a postmodern George Lucas movie or something that, like, I wasn't bothered by the fact that it was a MacGuffin. I was like, oh, I would have expected that in the first place based on what kind of tone and, and homages they were doing. Yeah, because none star, of the you drama or character hand. stuff comes from the Infinity Gem. It's just there and all the characters interacting is what pulls us through it to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I completely agree with what you're saying. Me too. Me uh, three. So, uh, uh, fi five minutes left uh, before we hit an hour. Any big things? There's, there's lots of stuff in this movie. I feel like we haven't even begun to touch on. Uh, is there, is there anything uh, major anybody wanted to bring up that we haven't gotten to talk about yet? Yeah, I'm really insulted as being an actual guardian of the galaxy that this is what they consider to be guardians of the galaxy. <laughs> Okay, so does anybody have anything that you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Um, yet? <laughs> I thought the way they kind of reinterpreted the Nova Corps was cool because, like, they yeah. they are in the comics straight up like a rip off of the Green Lantern Corps. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so shameless; it's not even funny. So I, I thought it was you know cool that instead of getting you know power helmets that allowed them to fly, they were actually in ships and uh, were kind of like. Um, a police force in space in cars, like, you know, space police cars or something. I thought that was cool. And um, I liked all of the Nova Corps members, like the people they cast as them, as brief as they were uh, in the film. Uh, like, I don't remember the woman's name uh, that played, like, the head Nova Corps, uh, like, diplomat lady, but she's a pretty big actress. I've seen her in a lot of things. Lynn Close, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, John C. Riley, I, I think, is hilarious, and, and the guy that... Uh, says uh what a bunch of bleep holes uh, that guy was funny too a bunch of a holes <laughs> yeah and i also really liked him because uh i didn't expect him to just be like a regular family man normal person yeah, yeah. exactly and that was really neat like he reminded me a little bit of miles o'brien from ds9 mm -hmm. oh and, yeah uh, yeah totally he also kind of looks a little bit like Colmini, but like, like, so, so I don't know. I thought that was really cool. Like, there was a lot of strangely down to earth things. One of the things I also really appreciated about, um, uh, about the planet was once they started talking about what Thanos was, or what, I uh, what, uh, Ronan was trying to do, I was kind of afraid that it was going to be like the, uh, I, I guess I'm going to Star Trek again, the, the Star Trek Generations thing where, like, there's the, there's a planet of people we never see and we're supposed to be worried about them, but we don't, we don't know, we, 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 we don't even see them. And so I was really glad that we actually went to that planet and got to see it and got to see those people involved because it would have been really easy to bypass that and never see those people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like we just saw, you know, a city planet with lots of different colored alien people on it. I don't know that I got to know them really all that well, but yeah, it was good to see them. We did, but at least we went there, yeah. and, and, and some of the movie's action took place on that planet. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's good. Uh, what's that? So quite a lot of the movies. Yeah, yeah. also, uh, the, that, that city looked very Starfleet Academy. I, I, saying, I thought it was a little weird oh, that they would be time. doing their, like, <laughs> shady dealings on the, at the, at the home base of the police of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right a, under their nose. It's an incredibly good point. They'll there. never expect it. <laughs> <laughs> when I deal drugs, I deal drugs right behind the police station. They never look there. <laughs> and like Rocket and Groot just walk around with a giant burlap sack, and nobody questions it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since it's wiggling, you know. Quit! Get out the bag. <laughs> Well, I guess it makes sense for them because they're just going to walk over and turn them in for the bounty. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, I know, but like nobody's suspicious. <laughs> nobody's like, I wonder what he's going to do with that giant bag. It's it's probably like the New York City effect on steroids, where New Yorkers are just like, oh, you know, that's really weird. But I've seen weirder things. I live in New York City. Well, and you know, we haven't <laughs> talked a whole lot about about just the, the the sheer quirkiness of this movie. I really like that nobody bats an eye at her talking raccoon. Like at all? Well, you just well, nobody bats an eye at anything. Um, uh -huh. Like even Star Lord, who you would think would be 
your, like, reactionary joke character because he's human and from Earth, he doesn't ever look at anyone, no matter how weird they are, and be like, oh, wow, you're really weird looking. Well, he also knows everything. Like, one of the things that's great about that character is that he's kind of our through because he's he's human and he knows 80s culture, and so there's a lot of things that we can latch onto. But but it's not like we're learning everything along with him. He gets to teach us stuff. He knows this 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 world and so like I, I really like moments like when he says oh these ships are made of this particular substance and they can't be be blown up so we can use them for weapons like he knows everything um well I, as speaking of ships can i mention um so the the the, the uh the nova core they have these ships that connect together and create a force field right up a ship just like the tholians okay I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> it's, a Tholian, no, it's a Tholian web. Watch TOS. It's a Tholian web. Okay. okay. It, it's the worst device ever because it doesn't work. And it's not like it doesn't work because of the Infinity Gem. It can't stop the ship. What they're designed for, it can't do. <laughs> That's true. I never thought of that. That's funny. <laughs> That's That's not a bad point. It's like you just need to latch on to something up top and on the bottom somehow. <laughs> That's a really good point you're making. Maybe they just didn't have enough ships to complete the Tholian <laughs> web. Maybe so. I mean, well, that ship's really bigger than design. they're used to. They had this really dumb design, though, where the shield would be the middle of the ship. So the ship that they're blocking could just ram into the front of them and destroy it. Oh, they're all dead. I, I mean, there's no question <laughs> about that. And there's, like, thousands of them. <laughs> I wondered that in the theater myself. I was like, do these things really, are these things so strong that they can, like, withstand most things, but Ronin ship is just, you know, a super BA ship? Everybody's got Stormtrooper Syndrome in this movie besides the Guardians. Jeez. <laughs> They're just completely incompetent at everything they try to do. <laughs> Vince, I think the point is that the web ships look cool. I think that's <laughs> like you're missing the point of it. They look cool. It's a cool idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that they ripped off from 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 uh, TOS. I'm 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 sure TOS ripped it off from Isaac Asimov or or Arlen Ellis oh, or something. Maybe. So I'm just saying, like like the, the, the Tholian web is incredibly well known. Like they 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 couldn't possibly have been doing that and not thinking everybody is going to know this is the Tholian web. I didn't know. Um, well, I, I, actually, actually, I have I have one more thing I want to make sure I mention on this video. Um, this is maybe the first time ever I've seen a complete movie redesign that I want to be incorporated in the comics. I thought Star Lord's outfit with his mask is the best Star Lord outfit I've seen. I think it's better than the Abnett Landing one. I think it's better than the one that he's got in the Bendis run. I think that mask is really cool. I like the coat. I think it, I think it's just it's a it's a nice redesign for that character. It's neat, although I don't think we're gonna see him use it much because he's not a Ravager anymore, and that was straight up Ravager gear. Do we see any of them use that use that mask? Not the mask, but I'm just talking about the coat. Oh, like that that coat. I don't know that we'll ever see him put that on again. He'll just All the get costumes a... they put on by the end of the movie are kind of similar to the Abnett and Landing ones too. Like Rocket Raccoon puts on his blue outfit and stuff like that. Oh yeah, that's cool. He'll just get a uh, like an Indiana Jones coat or something. He will have a coat in the second film, I assure you. <laughs> Well, um, let's let's go ahead and leave off. And, and the the, la the last thing I want to say is just here's a thing I never thought we'd see. And here's a thing that was way better than in a lot of ways it had any right to be. Um, like 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 I like I'm 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 really happy with it. You know, despite its flaws, it's not perfect. But like. I just, you know, you know, Marvel is showing us that they're a studio now. They make different kinds of movies. They're all set in the same universe, but they make different kinds of films. And that's really, really neat. And I don't think, especially with the with, with what we saw in the uh, after credit scene, we they, anything is possible now. They could do anything. You think we're going to get that Howard the Duck movie? I don't know that we'll get a movie, but I'm just saying, like, if they'll go that far, they'll put anyone in a movie. They should make a CG Howard the Duck Netflix show. That that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a brilliant idea. Telling you. No, don't say things like that. That's too good of an idea. I know this I, guy, uh, uh, George Lucas. I think he might he might be able to get this <laughs> off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna make the prequel to the first movie. It'll be great. Oh my god! Don't say don't say that. And then we'll learn everything about Star Lord's father. No, I'm talking about Howard the Duck. You'll learn like oh, stuff about Howard the Duck's evil father. 
Oh, the Howard the Duck prequel movie? Yeah, that's... and he'll talk about sand. It'll, It'll be all be set on Duck World. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a trilogy. You'll get the politics of the Duck World government and everything. <laughs> he'll, be a, he'll be a slave and he'll be like, touch the nose! <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, did, did I? Did any of you guys have uh, final thoughts? Well, really, really quick, we'll go around. Really quick, final thoughts. Eric, final thoughts. Um, I, I liked it. I actually, I have been looking for something like this forever. Like, I, I have scoured to find books or something that's like fun sci-fi adventure, like Star Wars, and it doesn't exist really. It's either super low budget, or I mean, there's some comics that kind of scratch that itch. Um. But other than that, like, I'm just happy to have an, another space adventure movie, um, regardless of, you know, its flaws or whatever. Um, I really, I really enjoyed it um, just for being what it is. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Um, variety is good. Steve. Um, yeah, I agree. I love this movie. It's a lot of fun. And we discussed a lot of the problems with it and some of its um, issues with the plot and Ronin. But none of that destroys the movie. It doesn't even make me like it less. It almost makes me like it more because at least it's having fun with it and it acknowledges that it isn't perfect within it. Um, I don't think it's better than Winter Soldier or Iron Man 3. I think those are the two best Marvel films ever made and probably two of the best superhero films ever made. But it's about as good as Avengers, if not a little bit better, because they handled the team building in a less generic way than that film. I think it's in Marvel Top 5, definitely. I, I don't know if I'd say it's better than Avengers. I, I, I have to sit on this movie for a little bit, but it's definitely in the Top 5 of Marvel. It's happily not too comparable to it either. They're, they're very different things. Well, I think that's true for a lot of the Marvel films as we go further and further into Marvel. Well, and I will tack on real quick that uh, one of the things, I'm going to say this earlier, one of the things that I was really worried about when Winter Soldier came out was, oh man, we're going to lead off the superhero summer with that movie? Like, that should have been the big final hurrah, right? That should have been in August. And then we get to this, and now that I've seen it, I can I can happily say, well, we didn't we didn't end on a downer or even like a mid-note. Like, it was, nah, that's, I mean. We're turtles. I mean, it's, it's still coming. We're not done yet. <laughs> I, I mean, for, well, I do mean for Marvel, though. I, I, but, but They're I'm say, still helping their branding along. But I'm saying for Marvel, you, you get, you, but yes, you're, yeah, you're, you're right. That's a good point. We'll find out. I'm going to see it tomorrow. We'll find out. But um, there is, but, but I'm just saying, like, like even though, yes, of course, I would say Winter Soldier is probably a, a technically better film than this. I'd rather end off the, 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 the Marvel movie season with really high-flying fun like this was. Uh, Dan, final thoughts. Yeah, I really liked the movie. I hope I didn't come off like I was dogging on it too bad. Um, I just we agreed with all the... Pr- that one hater on every show. No, I mean, like... And it's I always Dan. <laughs> Dan, you and I can share that burden. <laughs> all right. I'll take it today, I'll get it next time. But uh, I, I just agreed with, like, most of the praise you guys gave to the movie, and uh, the only thing I could, like, think of to say that wasn't, you know... Um, redundant was the things that i noticed that were kind of flaws in the movie but i really did enjoy it i had a great time watching it it made me laugh um i was invested in all the characters and um the one like other like you know thing that i was thinking about when watching this which isn't you know fair to the movie at all um (laughs) i I just want to preface by saying that is i really miss the fantastic four uh in cosmic marvel like uh that that really bugs me that it's not gonna be able to be a part of it I could not agree more. I mean, yeah. like you just hurt my feelings saying that. I, I didn't really think of that, but yeah. So we got all this great cosmic store stuff, but we don't get Galactus in this world, really. I well, want and, Galactus. Well, and and the scroll. I I forgot. Like while I was watching, I was like, when are the scroll gonna show up? Oh, they they don't have the rights to them. Yeah, I re- I really missed the scrolls in this, especially and with how big the Kree were, I I was I kept waiting for scroll mentions. Yeah, exactly. And you can't look at Thanos' chin and not constantly think of scrolls. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see like the negative zone and and I and like you know uh, the cosmic n- uh, nullifier, all that kind of stuff. That would be cool. But hopefully we get that stuff when when Fox does their Fantastic Four reboot. Well, and I'm wondering if some of like like Annihilus is is a Fantastic Four character, but he's also big in Annihilation. If they could have a thing like uh, like with Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, where they could make a case for. Well, it's also really part of this. That's very true. Yeah, I, I hope they can they can do that. I wish they could do that with Galactus and Silver Surfer too. But oh, they'll never get those. They won't. They won't get those. I would love to see the Fantastic Four in this universe, just so that we could have a second superhero team in a, in a universe that has a superhero team already. Because uh, you have the Avengers, 
who come together, and then you have the Fantastic Four who are already together. It and the Guardians be... are more of a band of riffraff. Like, they're kind of superheroes, but they're kind of not. Yeah, and I, I just like to see the Fantastic Four because, you know, the Fantastic Four family, they uh, these are people that or you know, predetermined before they became superheroes, they were already together. So we don't necessarily have to have the movie where they, they get together, they fight each other, and then decide to be friends. Well, based on the way uh, everybody's trying to mimic the Marvel formula, I'm sure by after Fantastic Four, before we get Fantastic Four 2, we'll get a Silver Surfer movie and a Skrull Kid Crew movie. And, uh, <laughs> somebody will beat the box and say, you know... <laughs> And then we'll get a movie where, like, the scrolls are really all the X-Men. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no, those, those okay. universes aren't connected anymore. Oh, they're not? Oh, I'm really, really, really glad to hear that. Yeah, because the X-Men are set in the past currently, and they didn't feel like trying to deal with that. Oh, that's a good point. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe it could have been cool, but, like, I don't need everything to be shared, you know? Like, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, Vince, what, what's your final thoughts real quick? Uh, I have not had this much fun seeing a movie in a long, long time. Now, that's not to say that, that this is the only movie I've enjoyed in the movie theater for a long time. I mean, of course, there was Days of Future Past, and there was uh, there was Winter Soldier, and these were good movies. But uh, this movie just reminded me why I started liking movies in the first place. So, just because it's a nice ride. Well, there's no higher praise for something like this, because that's clearly what it was trying to do. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody, uh, thanks always for listening. We sure appreciate it. Uh, everybody, thanks for joining me. This was a really fun panel. Woo! Nice. This, this was a good group. Thanks for being here with me. Next week, we're going to have another spoiler uh, podcast on uh, the new Ninja Turtles movie, and that will be very interesting. So um, expect a... Uh, yeah, expect it. Fun- Expect uh, how we're feeling about that uh, tomorrow or Friday, uh, and then um, next week we'll, there, will, there will be a spoiler podcast on that. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining me. Uh, I am Captain Logan. This was Vince. Woo, that's me. This is Eric Holden. Uh, we are grouped. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve Baxi. I didn't kick grass, so that's good. <laughs> oh, man, that was one of my favorite. You made me kick grass or beat up grass. <laughs> that's great. And Dan Torrey. I hope I wasn't as professionally boring this time. Professionally <laughs> boring? Do you get paid for it? <laughs> I'm, I'm paying to become about? professionally yeah, boring. They oh. pay for it. Because he's a poli sci major. <laughs> professionally boring. Everybody, thanks again for uh, listening. We should appreciate it. We'll see you later.